William I was Duke of Normandy. In 1066, he took England and the throne and ran it using the feudal system. On his death in 1088, he left Normandy to his first son, Robert Curthos, and England to his second son, William Rufus. William Rufus consolidated and expanded the boundaries of England into Wales, and when the Scottish king Malcolm III invaded, he beat back the Scottish army so decisively that he took back the northwestern area known as Cumberland. He left no children and therefore the next in line to the throne was Henry I. Through a series of events from 1100, Henry took the English throne and restored his territories to the same lands his father inherited and conquered. On the 1st of December 1135, Henry I died in Leon's La Foray. He sat on the throne of England for 35 years. His only legitimate heir, William, had died 15 years earlier on the 25th of November 1120, when the ship he was crossing the English Channel on, the White Ship, sank. Henry had named his daughter Matilda, widow of the Holy Roman Emperor and wife of Geoffrey of Anjou, as his heir and made his barons swear an oath of allegiance to her. At the time of Henry I's death, Stephen of Blois, Matilda's cousin, was in Boulogne and he made haste to London. Matilda was in Anjou at the time of her father's death. Stephen reached England before Matilda and Geoffrey. He was a more popular choice of the barons for the throne of England for a number of reasons including the fact that Matilda was a woman. She had a strong personality and the barons disliked Geoffrey of Anjou. Matilda had a personality much like her father and eldest son. This was admired in 12th century kings, but not in women. Chibnall acknowledges the consensus that Matilda set much stake in her status and this caused conflict between her and the barons. Stephen was crowned on the 22nd of December, 1135. Matilda invaded England to enforce her claim on her inheritance in 1139. However, Stephen at Arundel Castle besieged her. Stephen was captured in 1141 and imprisoned in Bristol. And the same year, a council of the English church deposed him and proclaimed Matilda the Lady of the English. During this time, Geoffrey was invading Normandy. He faced large opposition due to the Anjou's traditionally being their enemy. Following King Stephen's imprisonment by Matilda, Geoffrey gained control of lands between Bayeux and the Seine, with many Norman castles surrendering due to low morale. In the following years of 1142 and 1143, he continued to increase his territory through conquest. Following the fall of Norman capital Rouen, Geoffrey was declared Duke of Normandy in 1144, with the final Norman castles to still oppose him, Arcus, being captured in 1145. Geoffrey and Matilda held these lands until 1149, when they were given to their son, Henry II. From 1136 onwards, the powers and territory of King David I of Scotland and the Welsh rulers would dramatically increase. The return of Empress Matilda to capture the kingdom, civil war and baronial revolt, made it difficult for Stephen to deal effectively with either Wales or Scotland. The Welsh won at the Battle of Lewichwer in January 1136. Ceredigion and the royal castle Carmarthen were lost to the native Welsh. In Pembroke, Earl Gilbert Fitzgilbert was given virtually royal rights. By 1155, the three Welsh princes, Owain of Gwynedd, Madog of Powys, and Rhys ab Gruffydd of de Huba, respectively controlled the north, northeast, and south. David marched into northern England, and after reaching as far as Durham in February 1136, the Treaty of Durham was signed. While reversing many of David's claims, it gave David's son, Henry, rights over the earldom of Huntington, paying homage to Stephen, but in effect under Scottish control. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records, their messengers passed between them, and they came together, and were settled, but it availed little. Henry of Huntington claimed the Scottish army was made of a bare-buttocked foot soldiers, before David's reign. While the Scots were defeated at the Battle of Standard in 1138, Stephen was seen as characteristically too generous at the Second Treaty of Durham in April 1139, in which David's son Henry was given the earldom of Northumberland, Carlisle, Cumberland, Westmoreland, and a good part of Lancashire. Stephen also recognised the independence of Scotland. To R. H. G. Davis, Stephen was hopelessly ineffective. To J. H. Round, noble and unfortunate. 
William of Malmesbury claimed that though Stephen was strenuous in war, he was also mild and compassionate to his enemies. Bristol played an important role in the conflict during King Stephen's reign. Bristol Castle was held by Robert, Earl of Gloucester. Robert was the half-brother of the Empress Matilda. He constructed the stone keep at Bristol from 1122 and founded St James's Priory in 1129. In 1138, Robert sided with his sister and from that time on, Bristol Castle was the headquarters of the faction supporting the Empress. In 1140, civil war broke out and after being captured in 1141, King Stephen was held prisoner in the castle for nine months. Robert died in 1147 and Bristol Castle was held for the remainder of the anarchy by his son William. The future King Henry II visited Bristol Castle three times before becoming king. He stayed for 14 months in 1142 at the age of nine and visited again in 1149 and 1153. The castle was destroyed in the 1650s on the orders of Oliver Cromwell. King Henry II had a near impossible goal of reunifying the kingdom and re-establishing royal authority after the death of Stephen of Blois. Henry as Geoffrey, Count of Anjou's heir, had control of the counties of Maine and Toulouse, as well as the Duchy of Normandy by 1144. As the son of Empress Matilda, Henry had claim to the English throne as well. When his father died, Henry secured his holdings on the continent before traveling across the Channel to take up the fight with his mother in Bristol. At the same time, Henry was plotting his marriage to the infamous Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was, at the time, married to King Louis VII of France. Only eight weeks after Louis had his marriage annulled, Henry married Eleanor on the May 18, 1152, giving him claim to all of Aquitaine and heavily straining the relationship between the two rulers. After a truce with King Stephen in November of 1153, Henry became his adopted son and heir to the throne. Upon Stephen's death in October of 1154, Henry quickly returned to England, secured his power, and became ruler of one of the largest kingdoms in Europe. The period between 1066 and 1154 has been described by some historians as the Norman Empire. However, much debate exists over whether this was an accurate description. William the Conqueror ruled over Normandy and England, but administered them independently. On his death, he divided them between his two oldest sons. Had Henry I not united them as a consequence of death and conquest, the idea of a Norman Empire would never have existed. Henry I struggled with the issue of legitimate heirs. However, had he had two living sons at the time of his death, it is possible that the notion of a Norman Empire would again have been moot. It could be said that while Norman Empire is a convenient term for historians to describe the period when the Dukes of Normandy reigned in England, marking it from the earlier pre-conquest era and the later rule of the Plantagenets, it is unlikely that the Dukes of Normandy ever saw England and Normandy in these terms, and they certainly never administered them as such. Henry II reigned for 35 years and died in 1189. He had four sons and within his lifetime had endowed titles or land on all of them indicating that he never intended his territories to remain united. Again, historians refer to an Angevin empire, as it is an easy way to delineate the descendants of Geoffrey of Anjou, who ruled England and various other territories after Henry II's ascension in 1154. The term is commonly used to suggest the rulers of the 12th and 13th centuries. It can be argued that at its greatest extent, the territories held by Henry II and Richard I were never an empire, but a disparate and diverse collection of lands administered in their own unique way, with often the only thing they had in common being the man who ruled them, who, by the nature of his vast holdings, spent very little time in many of them. The sheer size of the lands of Henry II mean that it can be argued that their nature made them more individually independent, as they were managed without the day-to-day -day presence of their ruler, rather than the opposing view that their sole ruler made them an empire in the colonial sense.